what's up everyone and welcome to week three <laughs> week three of the what's your why series oh and i'm sorry take it off my hat and you'll see why uh this episode is with pastor or pastor emeritus uh lee eckliff um he is a awesome awesome man of god he was a pastor for over 40 years and man when i say that this conversation is so enriching it is so enriching and yes, I'm sorry, y'all. I'm still in the closet. You see the stuff in the background. I'm wearing the same clothes. I'm shooting all this in one day because I want to get this stuff out. But, <laughs> but yes, Pastor Lee Eckliff, man, he is a phenomenal man of God. He drops some serious nuggets in this episode. Oh my gosh. I pray that you guys are blessed by this episode, like the way I'll be blessed by this episode. Man, I've really enjoyed our conversation. Um, he is a young man at heart. He is a young man for real. Uh, and he has a lot of experience, a lot of uh, wisdom, a lot of nuggets. And you'll see this episode, man, our conversation. It is so great. Uh, I, I really enjoyed talking to him because one of the things about his ministry and what he's doing is that he's actually helping um, other pastors and other leaders, you know, kind of find their purpose and, and find their um, their way in ministry. Um, and he, you know, he serves at, almost as a mentor to a lot of these guys. And you see his heart in this episode, you know, you hear his heart um, for ministry, his why, when he started back um, back 40 years ago in ministry um, up until now, even in his new purpose and his new passions that he's doing, you know, he's doing things that is uh, amazing. Um, I am support of what he's doing 100%. Um, I love this guy 100%. And I pray that you guys are blessed by this conversation. Let's do it. So the first question is just straight off the rip. You know, what is your why? Um, now, you talked about being in ministry for 40 plus years and you recently retired um, back in February. And so you you missed the whole <laughs> the fun <laughs> of pastoring during this pandemic. Right. Um, but going back, I would say going back 40 years ago when you first started pastoring, you know, what was your why then? And what carried you from from then till now and mm. your purpose even now in your new ministry? What's your why for that? It develops over years. It, it, you get it's like you start with a line drawing of being a pastor. Mm -hmm. And as time gets goes by, you're filling it in, you're coloring it, you're adding background and it becomes much clearer or, or fuller, you know, but I think for me, the, the why is the chance to shepherd the people of God. Mm. Uh, other pastors are really motivated heavily by winning the lost, which is obviously very important. Right. I have just always been motivated by shepherding the flock and um, what goes with that. Um, I, I was drawn to the, I mean, I've always gone to church. My family was, I grew up in a rural church in South Dakota. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, um, I like church. And then there was a place where I just gradually God you know, made clear to me, I mean, we can talk more about calling and all, but I, I love shaping environment. Mm. Uh, a lot of people are motivated by a goal, mm -hmm. by a mission. I discovered about myself, and it took a long time for this to come clear, I discovered I'm more motivated by creating an environment hmm. and the environment is a home. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I've written a whole book about this, you know, it's called feels like home. I found that the, the concept that the, the, the metaphor, the mental picture of the church, as the household of God, which is actually not a metaphor. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we, <clears throat> pardon, <clears throat> pardon me, JT, uh, TJ. No problem. Um, the, how, the church really is God's family. It's yeah. not like God's family. 
it is God's family. Right. Uh, we are like a bride or like an army or like a body, but we are God's family. And that mental picture of creating a family environment where we help people grow and mature like parents do to children <clears throat> and discern what those people are gifted to be, mm -hmm. what they're not gifted at, where their vices and virtues are, and to help that family grow in Christ. Mm. That, that's my why. And uh, my, I wrote an article, I just read it before we started. <clears throat> My currency in life, that's my language. Your language is what's your why. Mm -hmm. My currency in life is influence. Mm. I want to leave a mark. And I want to influence people so that, you know, years ago, I was out of work. I was looking for a job and I told God, you know, I'll take any job you give me. Mm -hmm. I wasn't in the ministry. I was just looking for a job. But I found myself saying to God, but I would so love to do a job that will matter in a hundred years. Mm. That was the language I used. And it, that didn't mean it couldn't be in manufacturing. It was just whatever it is, however I do it, I want to be, I want there to be ripples that go out for a hundred years. Wow. <clears throat> that goes to this desire I have to, uh, lead, to be an influence. So that's my why. Sorry, I'm, I'm just taking notes. I mean, you are dropping gems. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when you say your desire to be an influence, that, that speaks volumes because that aligns with my desire in this current season because with not just with the podcast or anything like that, but just in ministry in general is that I want to be an influence and I want to be able to, you know, create an experience or an environment as you spoke of um, where people can be open to receiving God, but at the same time, you know, it doesn't warrant them to change, you know, kind of their their initial um, fabric or what makes up their D or what makes them up right now. Because as Christians, and you and I know, um, we all have a past. You know, we didn't just come into this thing, you know, clean. And for some odd reason, and I believe it's definitely the enemy, you know, just telling people and tricking people's minds, is that they believe that they have to come to Christ clean and already in a perf perfected state in order to be a Christian. And it's not really that. Um, and my desire in this season is to, un I won't say uncover, you know, the, the, the truth about people, but it's to show the humanity in people especially right. Christians, because people tend to forget that we are humans before right. we anything else um, <clears throat> we, have, we have this charge to love people to honor people to respect people whether we agree or disagree with them um, and we're even in this season where it's just so much disagreement and so much turmoil you know we are still charged to love individuals who are different than us um, who don't look like us who don't act like us uh, who may be across different denominations or maybe an entirely um, another religion, but we are still charged to love them and respect them. Yep. With the love of Christ. You know, I came across, a, I was in class in seminary many years ago, and my professor, who was Dr. Warren Wiersbe, he dropped this quote, and who said it is a little vague, but the quote is... Um, and I, and I have since required classes I've taught to memorize this verbatim. Mm -hmm. The quote is, uh, be kind for every person you meet is fighting a great battle. Right. And I think as Christians generally, and as pastors specifically, there is a kind of, let me tell you a little story. There was a guy in my, uh, one of my previous churches back in Pennsylvania named Jim. Mm -hmm. And he was, um, he was a retired uh, blue collar worker. He had come to faith in Jesus um, late in life, in his 60s. 
and he was the funniest, most enjoyable guy. He was crazy guy. <laughs> but um, his his ministry at our church, he was an usher, okay. Mm-hmm. But his real work wasn't before people went into the service. It was when they came out. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't to the adults. It was to the children. Mm. And during church, somewhere, he kept a stash of Smarties. You know what those are? Those little rolls of candy. Rolls of candy, yeah. Right. And he'd fill his suit coat pockets with these things. And when kids come out, came out, he gave everyone one of these little things. And they all gathered around him, right? right? And we all watched that. It made us happy. It actually would bring tears to my eyes. It was so beautiful. You know, how are you, honey? You know, and here you go, sweetheart, and like that, you know. Well, that's become my mental picture for what I do wherever I go. Mm. I got grace in my pockets. Mm. So, um, you know, I sat at a coffee shop this morning. This fellow that comes in who's a kind of, I can't figure him out. He's sort of disheveled. He brings a philosophy book. Uh, he yammers on, you know. <laughs> well, I don't know if I can influence him for Jesus or not. I'm not, I haven't gotten to witnessing. It's just like, all right, kindness means I will give him attention. Mm. And, you know, that's true. As Christians, I think when we give people attention, there is something of Jesus in that grace, that gift we give. Right. And it does, it's, it's, sometimes it leads to just this apt word. You know, we just, by the Spirit of God, just happen to say a, a, just a kind thing or an insightful thing or who knows. Right. But, and as pastors, I think we especially are, um, enabled to do that. Now I'm, you know, I'm blessed with sort of an outgoing personality. It's easy for me to, I can walk up to just about anybody in a restaurant or somewhere and figure out something to talk about, you know, yeah. but I think no matter who we are, whether we write a note or, or pray for somebody, we influence people more than we know. If we, if we are simply trusting that Jesus can do something through me. Yeah. And pastoral work, you know, you know, TJ, that there is a temptation in ministry to think that our ministry grows by how many people we're talking to. Mm -hmm. So the pastor with a huge church is more influential than a pastor of a little church. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's true. Uh, influence isn't measured that way. Right. I mean, the pastor of a big church faces the limitation that he can't really, really touch. Yeah. You know, he can't touch those people. And you know, he knows that. And that's a hard thing for some pastors. They miss the days when they knew everyone. So I, I'm not faulting them. God has given them that position, you know. But the pastor of a smaller church, like I pastored, where I knew every person, I knew every child, I could say something, I could just, I don't know, you know, step into their life. That's a powerful thing. It is. And it's a, it's a misnomer to think if I could write for more people, if, you know, if I got to write a book instead of just preach my little sermons, that would really be influence. But that's not true. I've written books. I'm glad I got to do it. I trust that God is using them. But I was a pastor for a long time without anything like that. And uh, I don't know that the book has more influence than sitting with somebody at a hospital. Right. That's the nature of the kingdom. You know, little things. Mm-hmm. Little things are big, and you don't know which ones are which. Yeah. You, don't know. you don't. And... To your point, I mean, it makes me think a lot about um, about how influential that we should be as um, I'm, I'm a minister, but or an elder. Um, how influential our positions are or our titles are. 
Um, as you said, pastors, and I agree wholeheartedly, pastors have the influence of their sheep, of their flock, because they are responsible for, you know, teaching, leading, pastoring those people through tough times, through good times, through crazy times. Um, and a pastor of a big church, it would be hard and downright difficult to really pastor a large church on your own because of the, 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 the elements that come into pastoring. Um, my idea for pastoring is, is, is biblical, you know, you're there for your flock, you're there for your sheep. <clears throat> and I can only imagine how difficult it is for a pastor of a large mega church to do that because, you know, if you have to reach out to someone, if someone has lost a, a loved one in their family in your church, it's hard for you to reach out to them if someone else on another side of on the other side of the church has other ailments. And then it's like, exactly. you, know, you, you can't. Different you have to kind of yeah, you have to kind of protect yourself, TJ, because you you can't bear. You can't you can't even remember their names, right? Let alone kind of bear the burdens, the emotional burdens to enter into a relationship. Right. You know, I mean, even if you called them, you can only be sort of surface in most cases. Mm. And, we, and all pastors have to face that. You know, we, in a previous church, grew to, you know, maybe 600 plus. So it wasn't huge. But at that level, I found I was forced to sort of put fences around myself. Mm. I couldn't, I couldn't handle anymore. You know, I couldn't remember all these names. And uh, there were new, th new things that were happening, new ways of influence that came with a larger size and a, lar a larger reputation. Those were good things. And some days I really missed them. Mm -hmm. But when I was uh, when I went to a new church that was much smaller, a fourth the size. Um, honestly, you know, I thought, well, it's in the suburbs. There's lots of people. There's big churches around us. I'm a good guy. I'm a good preacher. It's going to grow, right? Oh, it didn't. We had, we had wonderful, we had a wonderful church. We had ex extraordinary high turnover because of students and uh, corporate people and retirement. It was just people coming and going all the time. So it felt, you know, it, there was, uh, felt like it was growing which, because there were new people. But it just didn't get bigger, which for a lot of pastors, that's kind of a kick in the teeth. Yes, yeah, it's, it's kind of concerning. <laughs> right. It's the, it's the measure. We think the measure of our ministry is how big it is. Mm -hmm. And if it's small, it's, well, it's going to get bigger or, or I'm not worth my salt. Right. But God doesn't work that way. Mm -mm. You know, and we don't know how big the church in Ephesus was or the church in Corinth or for a good reason. It didn't matter. Yeah. It's not important. Right. You know, we know about numbers in the book of Acts when they started, we see these kind of exploding numbers. Mm -hmm. And numbers aren't mentioned again till the end of Revelation, mm -hmm. when, when you can't count anymore, right. right? And there's nothing in between. And uh, that's such a hard lesson for us because we naturally think that my influence for Christ would be greater if I could just get to more people. Mm. But that's not true. That is not true. And it's so seductive. It is. That it, and it kills people. It kills pastors. Uh, because if they're not struggling with it, then their leaders are leaning on them. You know, you're not doing your job. We need to get bigger. We need, we know we can't pay the bills or we got this church we need to fill or, you know, how come we're not growing? And there is a side where pastors have to be aware, you know, of, outreach and evangelism and yeah. you know we don't can't be lazy mm -hmm. but there are missionaries in places where have been wonderful hard workers who don't have much to show for it you know you know 
we like to say, you know, quote Jesus, the field is white under harvest. Not all fields are white under harvest all the time. All you got to do is live in a farming community and know that. <laughs> right? I mean, some are, some aren't. Some and, are. you know, Paul said there are others went before and now you're reaping. Mm -hmm. Jesus said that. Now you're reaping. So um, to be content, hardworking, focused, but I'm here, I'm going to influence people for Jesus as he gives me the opportunity. For a pastor, the number, the, the, the front line, the number one tool or, or responsibility is the word of God. Mm. Um, you know, remember in Ephesians 4, he says, uh, when, he, when he, Christ went to heaven, he led captives in his train, yeah. <clears throat> in his procession. Mm -hmm. And I call them the happy captives, you know, and we're, we're all marching to Zion and we're singing free at last. Thank God almighty. I'm free at last. Mm -hmm. And out of that group, here we all are marching along. It's like the Holy spirit kind of sneaks in and we don't recognize him. Mm -hmm. And he reaches over and taps you on the shoulder and says, come here. I want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. He taps me on the shoulder. Come here again. And you go, what, what did I do? <laughs> He goes, you're going to be one of my gifts to the church. And he names the gifts. <clears throat> when we think of spiritual gifts, we think of capacities to do things. But in this particular passage, it's not the capacity, it's the person. Wow. He gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Mm -hmm. The gift isn't that you have the gift of pastoring. It is you as a pastor are the gift. Right. Right. And he gives us back to this, this group, uh, this procession. Mm -hmm. It's almost like we were born again, again. Right. You know, we were captured once, then we're captured again. We're double, double prisoners. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we're, we're bound to serve these people. And we don't get to choose big or little. Right. We don't get to choose people who are wonderfully responsive to Jesus or not. Cause God knows there are people, pastors serving churches with cantankerous, difficult, hard-hearted people. Yeah. And there's others who have churches where there's just a sweet spirit and you don't get to pick. Yeah, you don't. Right? You, you, you got to go do this and you bring your, the grace of Jesus and your God-given capacity uh, to influence this, mm. this Christ-likeness. You know, TJ, there's a, when I was uh, back in the early 80s, we had a, you probably weren't even born. Uh, <laughs> there was this TV show called The Greatest American Hero. And uh, the drift of the show was this very ordinary school teacher comes across this suitcase. And when he opens it, there's a superhero suit in the suitcase. Mm -hmm. And he tries it on and suddenly he's got powers mm -hmm. like Superman. Mm -hmm. And you see him in the opening credits every week, like jumping out the window, but he, he hasn't quite mastered it. Mm. So you see him trying to fly, but he's kind of flopping, around. <laughs> right. runs into a wall or falls into a river, you know? And, and that's sort of the fun of the, of the show was this guy who had powers, but wasn't that great at him. Right. Trying to figure it out. That's you and me. Yeah. That's what happened to me. God called me to be a pastor these these uh, four i call them word workers mm. apostles prophets evangelists pastors teachers mm -hmm. those are word workers that's the one thing they all have in common they do something with the word of god and we put this cape on in fact we call it the mantle right of right. leadership from the story of elijah yep. and elisha we put this cape on like a superhero and we got to figure out how to do this. And we find gradually, I have more capacity than I ever imagined because God gave it to me. I'm a pastor. Mm -hmm. I didn't know I could do this. I didn't know I have this influence, this effect. I get up to preach and my goodness, people listen. Mm -hmm. They go home and say, thank you, pastor, for that word that helped me. It was just what I needed today. Really? <laughs> really? I know what I went through to get it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'll never forget how you came and visited me in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Really? I visited you in the hospital? <laughs> I don't remember that. 
<laughs> that's what it's like. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And it's 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 funny that you drew on that um on that verse uh, or the the chapter of Ephesians four. Um, yeah, that's essentially what one faith is all about. It comes from Ephesians four and five. One Lord, one faith. Oh. Yeah, one Lord, one faith. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, and in the What is One Faith um, episode that I did um, earlier, I actually talked about that and I talked about the, the spiritual gifts. Um, and the premise behind One Faith is that, you know, we are using our spiritual gifts in unison, not to, for, to unify the body of Christ, as Ephesians 4 um, says, and to, you know, upbuild the body of Christ, not to, um, use our spiritual gifts to damage the body of Christ. And so often in this day and age, we see so many leaders um, and so many people abuse their spiritual gifts um, and harm the body of Christ. And because of that, that's how you see a lot of people leave the flock and they become, um, you know, they, they join other religions or they join exactly. because of the mishandling of our spiritual gifts and the example that you gave is, is, is spot on because in so many ways we have many leaders who are just putting on the cape. They're trying to figure it out every day how to do this thing, because even though we have the, the Bible to show us how to do things um, and how to lead and, and, and how to pastor, you know, there are instances where we're coming across an example and we can't pinpoint it exactly to a, a specific sect or a specific story in the Bible. We have to learn how to right. educate and rely on the Holy Spirit. <laughs> right. That's right. The right True. direction for it. You know, we have this expression. We don't, it's become an expression. You say, they never taught me this in seminary. <laughs> I mean, every pastor says that, mm -hmm. you know, they didn't have this in Bible school. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever told me about what to do here, you know. That's just the way it is. It happens all the time. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite things to get when I got together when I get together with other pastors is to just hear our stories because you go, "Oh man, how did you do this?" You know. <laughs> one thing I wanted to say, you know, I really your your emphasis on the one faith, mm -hmm. DJ. This season we're living in right now, mm -hmm. especially with the racial issues, mm -hmm. pastors are really the ones who can do more than anyone else. African-American pastors, white pastors, Hispanic pastors, if they know Christ and know the word, they know we got to get to that. Yes. And you see that where something's working, you see pastors together, mm -hmm. learning from each other, humbling themselves before each other, we're all bewildered. We don't know what to do all the time. It's not like we have some plan. We come with our mess and everything, but the answer is not those kids out there doing whatever they think, you know, no matter how proud, you know, how eager they are for justice. You know, that's not, fervency doesn't count for much. Right. It's, it's, the, it's only Christ and it's pastors on the front we say we have to be wise. We have to, we have to be models. Mm. We have to be prayers. Mm. You're here in Rock. I'm just new to this city of Rockford, um, but one of the first things I found out about was, oh yeah, there are pastors here, black and white and Hispanic, who who pray together every week. The mayor welcomes them. That's awesome. That's amazing. That's awesome. The police chief welcomes them. I mean, I, really, you know, this, and, and they, they, uh, it's, it, it's great because this is a city with, you know, a lot of problems and stuff. But I just, I, I think about that. I think our conversation, mm -hmm. which centers on, we both know Jesus and we both care about shepherding the flock, a church, not the humongous church wow. you know you got your flock i got i've had mine you know we've got to do these things we're as unlikely as we are 
we're, we're the best hope for this. <laughs> You're right. and I really should say you because I'm retired. I don't have a flock of my own right now, but it's the pastors who are really on the front lines. And for you to say that is, it's very, um, it's, it's confirming because I did a, um, an episode a couple of, um, a couple of weeks back with one of my, um, one of my friends, he's actually, uh, he's an elder as well in, the, in our church and he's the youth pastor. And we talk about everything that we are looking at today with Black Lives Matter um, and the, the rising of that movement and the organization. And we actually, we're, well, the episode is actually um, airing now um, where we're talking about, you know, the difference between Black Lives Matter, the, the cause and Black Lives Matter, the organization and how it can be confused and people can actually take Black Lives Matter and turn it into an idol. And one of the things that he said was that was so f- profound is that it's exactly what you said. The church should be leading this cause. The church should be leading um, in not going out looting and rioting and all this other stuff, but should be leading when it comes to talking about these matters of injustice, talking about these matters that, 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 that is damaging the body of Christ. And the fact that we have neglected it for so many years we are now seeing the rise of Black Lives Matter because of the failures of the church. And it was so profound that he said that. And I was like, man, that, that, is, that is so powerful because when you look at, I hate to say it, but when you look at the church on, on a daily basis, every Sunday, I've heard a, a, a quote that said the most, segregated, the most segregated time yeah. of, is Sunday mornings. Yeah. That is heartbreaking. And yeah. to me, it's like, how can we get back to, well, I don't even say get back, but how can we get to a place where we can unify again as the body of Christ, as we're supposed to be? Um, and that's, that's the whole premise of One Faith. Yeah. As you were saying, I just love that example of what's going on in Rock. I don't mean to cut you off, but I just love that example because I wish that there was more of that around the country. And I feel like if there was more of that around the country, we wouldn't have a lot of these issues, a lot of these problems. Right. right. You know, I think, I think the Sunday morning service is not, it's not the real issue. Mm-hmm. I mean, all kinds of people, I mean, uh, Pentecostal people and Presbyterian people, they, they can love each other and love Jesus, but they, they don't worship together because they're not alike. Yeah. And black people and white people, I get that we have different things. and I, That doesn't bother me. But what's so significant is the, you know, I've been in prayer groups where these denominations of all sorts are represented together. Mm-hmm. And we know that while we care a lot about these certain distinctives, we know they're not the most important thing. Yes. And I think with Black Lives Matter, the thing that Christians can put the right nuance to that, right? Black lives do matter. And we're saying that because they haven't mattered enough in the past. It's not nobody saying they matter more than somebody else. It's just saying, but you forgot about it. Right. Well, the church and our love for Christ can bring the right what language and the right words. Black lives matter because Jesus died for black lives as well as everybody else. Exactly. Black lives matter because God created people with, with, these, with this dignity and this value. And whenever that gets lost, whatever culture or color or well then that's the church's issue right and we are kind of been you know as, as white church we've been kind of slapped in the face like well, well, you know, wake up and no no we can't understand this we we can't feel, i grew up in south dakota i never saw a black man wow literally we had american indians native americans 30 miles away I hardly ever saw them. That was a separated world. 
now I'm aware, you know, now God has said, okay, Lee, it's time to wake up. You're, you're, you're in a new place. You're in a new season of life, a new part of our culture. I can't help where I came from any, any more than you can, right? Wow. But it's our job as the pastors to be gentle, to be wise, to be um, attentive, not only to one another, but especially to how the Holy Spirit would help us on an individual basis with our particular place to be agents of grace. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I, I have met a few black, I mean, I, my circles aren't large, but the black pastors I've met in my world were extraordinarily sensitive, I thought. Mm -hmm just wise, uh, uh, the, the kind of wisdom you get from burden bearing, mm. you know, not from age, age doesn't necessarily do anything all the time, <laughs> but just m men who were tested mm. and who knew these things, knew Christ, knew that justice is not the primary thing grace is the primary thing right right justice is a, a, a piece of grace mm -hmm. just like forgiveness is a piece of grace mm -hmm. and you know you hear so many now you know shouting for justice and i go yeah you don't have anywhere to put that mm -hmm. in your in your heart mm -hmm. you don't have anywhere you you're you're a, you're a, you can shout for justice here but you're not just over there mm -hmm. you, you're a sinner, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, you're you're not just your kids or your mom or your you know the, the guy at the grocery store. I mean, we and we're the ones because we know the word of God. Yeah. We know what God can do to bind us with brothers and sisters just in our local church. We're positioned if we if we are humble. Yeah. If we're hum that is the deal, man. We got to be humble. You got to, you know, and uh, where everyone is just not humble right now. Everybody wants to, <laughs> everybody wants to be the top dog. Everybody wants to, to be, you know, prestigious and different things like that. But we, yeah, so it's we, really hard in any context. I mean, standing in the grocery store, it does. It's really hard to be angry and humble. Yeah. It is. There, Jesus was, Jesus knew how to be angry and humble. He was perfect. <laughs> Right, but that's a hard thing, right? Because right. anger in most cases is fueled by pride. Like, mm. how come he got to get in line before me? Mm -hmm. And you get angry about it. And you go, well, that's not fair. Well, I know, but what's coming out of me isn't so good, you know? Right. James says, what causes conflicts and quarrels among you? Don't they spring from your own evil desires at work within you? Mm -hmm. And I want to go, well, not particularly. It comes from that other guy over there who's really a jerk. <laughs> That's why I have a conflict, <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, maybe he is, but James makes me look at myself. Mm. Well, I've taken you way off your... your. Um, oh, no, it's, it's fine. This is like quality content. I, I love it because it, it, it all lines up. I mean, we're talking about a lot of things, and um, I feel that people will be blessed by the conversation that we're talking about um even if it do venture into some of the current aspects. okay that's good so um when you were called to ministry <clears throat> did you answer the call right away um and if not why did you ignore the call and what prompted you to eventually acquiesce to it that was an interesting question when i thought about it <laughs> i actually headed toward ministry without a call. Wow. I was actually ahead of it. And what happened was, you know, I grew up in church. I was kind of good up in front. Mm -hmm. uh, when we were in college, I was with, uh, in a singing group of seven and we traveled all over the place and sang in churches and I liked it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, I'm pretty good at this. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I can speak. I love Jesus. I love the Bible. And I like church, so maybe I'll just be a pastor because I'd be good at it, right? Mm. And uh, I studied uh, Christian education, you know, children and whatnot when I was in college. 
And uh, our college was associated with a uh, major seminary. And I, so I went straight into seminary. Mm-hmm. And it just seemed like a good choice. So at the end of my first year of seminary, I got a chance sort of unexpectedly to do a, a, a summer internship in a church out in Rapid City, South Dakota. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I had a great experience. But in the course of it, I was, you know, part of my internship, I had to read books about the ministry and whatnot. And uh, I started coming across the council. If you can do anything other than be a pastor, you should do it. Mm. And I thought, oh, easy. I could, yeah, I just thought, I just picked it because I thought, you know, like other people making a career choice. And it was, it wasn't uh, selfish really, or, or it was just, yeah. And in the mercy of God, that same summer, the school where I had attended called and offered me a position. And I thought, okay, well, I guess I'm not called to be the, to, to the ministry. So maybe that's good. And I just thought how blessed I am that I had a year of seminary. How many laymen are going to be able to say that? I'll be really useful. You know, it was just positive. It wasn't a negative. And I dropped out of seminary. And I worked for about five years and I enjoyed it immensely. So my, my call to the ministry was uh, really s- sudden and crystal clear. It isn't for everybody. Right. It's just like people come to know. Some people can't tell you the day they became a Christian. Mm-hmm. They just sort of know they are and they can't name a day or plant a flag. You know. Mm-hmm. But for me, I had... Uh, I had been working for a Christian organization for a year and I was going to have a job review. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had this wonderful boss and he'd asked me to fill out some forms. You know, I can't really remember much about it, but I remember walking into his office. I don't think I'd even sat down and he said, Lee, with your interest, why aren't you in the ministry? Mm. And uh, the next day, same day, this all happened within four days. Um, my best friend, he'd been my best man in my wedding. He was a pastor. We'd started seminary together. Mm-hmm. Now he was done. He was pastor uh, up in Wisconsin. I was in Illinois. And I didn't realize this at the time. I didn't realize this until recently. He drove all the way down to see me. I thought he was just in the area for something. Mm-hmm. And I was telling him, um, you know, I don't know if I can keep, I was in fundraising. I, thought, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I got the guts to go to, you know, major donors and ask them for money, and no matter how much you believe in what you're doing. And the reason he'd come down was to tell me, he said, Lee, I've always thought you ought to be in the ministry. Mm. I went home and told my wife, Susan, who had always said she didn't want to be married to a farmer or a pastor. <laughs> And I told her, I said, this is what Dick said. And she says, yeah, he's right. Wow. And uh, a day or so later, I got a phone call from a church we had sung in. I think it was six years previous when I tried to figure it out Hmm. in Colorado. And they remembered me. And they said, we're looking for a youth pastor. And you came to mind. Oh, wow. Now, I didn't pursue that, but that was four times in less than a week. Hmm. And that was my call to ministry. That was clear to me then. And uh, in just a remarkable way within about, within oh, just a couple of weeks, it, there was an opening in our church for a staff person. And one thing led to another. I was hired. I, they sent me back to seminary and paid my way. Wow. That's so I went part-time to school while I finished school, uh, while I worked. So I had a very clear call to the ministry. And in answer to your question, I was in the, I was heading for the ministry before I should have been in a way, you know, that's, in a sense. Neat because I've never heard anyone that has spoke about, you know, heading towards the ministry before being called. You know, I, I have seen where people will go to seminary just to learn or just to, to gain knowledge and then eventually call. But for someone to just, you know, head towards it and not even, you know, 
you had the desire because you thought it, you would be good at it. And then the call came. It was that that in and of itself is very interesting because for me and what I've how I've been um, brought up and, and seen in churches all across North Carolina. <laughs> It's that, you know, there's a call, there's an initial call, and then, then you go into the ministry. It's never, oh, well, I'm just going to go to school and, 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 you know, become a pastor. But it's always been prompted by, you know, an initial experience or an encounter that you have with God. The challenge, a challenge is, however it is that God, you know, kind of grabs us and, and points us, there is this there's some kind of preparation, mm -hmm. you know, around the world, not everybody has a chance to go to a, a seminary or a mm -hmm. Bible college, but the, I've just been, I, I've been writing a column every week for uh, preaching today from Christianity today. And uh, for the last uh, several, I've focused in Acts chapter 20, where Paul is saying farewell to the, Ephesian elders. Mm -hmm. I've just been kind of taking a, a verse or two at a time and just meditating. It's not a exposition or a sermon. I get, I get 600 words. That's a little over a page. So it's, you know, thoughts. But what stands out to me is um, one, on the one side, Paul says right off the bat, the very first thing he says is, you know how I lived when I was among you. Mm -hmm in great humility and with tears and under severe persecution, testing. I think, okay, first off for pastoral preparation is to get small. Mm. And it, you know, TJ, it's, it, it's just difficult for young, younger people to get small. Yeah. If you know, you don't have to be arrogant to be kind of sure of yourself. Yeah. You know, I, and me too. I mean, and I'm still that way, but, but part of our pastoral training, mm -hmm. it's like Alice in Wonderland. We have to drink what, that little thing and you, we get small, you know, we had to get small yeah. because we can't, <laughs> to maneuver in the kingdom of God, you know how Jesus says you have to be like little children. Right. He's not saying we have to be childlike. You know, the, we have to be child sized. Yeah. And when I was, when our son was little, I'd take him to one of those, um, those parks with the big wooden castles and everything. And you crawl around in them, you know, in the forts and the airplane. Well, I learned pretty quickly he works there a lot easier than I do. <laughs> you know, I, I'm a big guy and crawling up and down these things and into those little rooms, that was yeah. not good for me. Right. That's what the kingdom of God is like. Mm. And ministry humbles us. It does. And we tend to, it, we, we tend to have this pedestal. Mm -hmm. You know, I get to get up in front and preach. Mm -hmm. I'm the one that everybody calls pastor and they, you know, sh they want to know me. And uh, that's, that's kind of easy to get big headed. Yeah. And, and we don't even have to try. You don't have to be arrogant. You just forget that I need to be small mm -hmm. inside. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Mm -hmm. Blessed are the meek. Those who mourn, I don't think it has to do with the, uh, grief i think it has to do with uh, sinfulness mm -hmm. you know i it grieves me what i am mm -hmm. that is the person that god can use then on the uh, so paul says that but then on the other side besides this demeanor of vulnerability he says you know this later he says um for three years i never stopped warning you with tears and those elders knew they could remember Paul weeping over them. Yeah. That's, that's a pastor right there. Mm -hmm. But then the, the other main emphasis is the word of God. He says, I, 
I never failed to proclaim the, the word of God to you publicly and privately and evangelistically to the lost, you know, uh, the will of God, the whole will of God. He just talks about the, the word of God. Pastors can be amazingly careless mm -hmm. about really studying the word of God. Yeah. You know, just working at it. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what anybody else does. Well, I know some colleagues and whatnot, but a sermon for me was a 12 to 15 hour job. Hmm. Um, I needed to think. Yeah. You know, I needed to, I'd call it pestering a text. Mm -hmm. I'd print it out on a piece of paper with kind of wide margin. I'd get colored pencils. I would try to help me you know, understand this thing. I would study it. I'd pray. I'd go, God, I don't get this. Why did you say this after that? I would have said such and such. Mm -hmm. Why is this important? Well, why did you put it that way? And I just pester it, mm -hmm. you know, like, like a little kid, you know, hey, dad, hey, dad. <laughs> you know, hey. <laughs> but to study the Bible hard and to not just get the facts, mm -hmm. but to, uh, Eugene Peterson called it contemplative exegesis. Mm. And that was really a great phrase. I've used that in my own mind for a long time. I got to study. A pastor is asking for trouble. He will step into trouble. Mm -hmm. The wolves will get him or he'll become one. Yeah. If he doesn't, study the Bible. And if God gives an opportunity to go to school somewhere, mm -hmm. somehow take it yeah. because it isn't enough to just love Jesus and have a Bible. Right. You know, we, we need to know the subtleties, right? You know, I, I just, the piece I just wrote and sent today will come out tomorrow morning is that in that section, he talks about the wolves. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, they're not just difficult people. We all have difficult people in churches, and they do damage. But he's talking about people who, he says, who distort the truth and draw others after them. Yep. They, they're little shepherds, right? And they, uh, uh, we, the, they distort the truth. They give it a twist. You know, these aren't Buddhists. These aren't atheists. These are people who are, almost orthodox yeah you know they'd say yeah i believe in heaven i believe in hell i believe jesus is the son of god or whatever it might be there's something that's off yeah. out of kilter yeah. and a pastor has to have the savvy to go no where you're going is not going to work and some of those things are glaring but not always you know, uh, and so to have, and, and it's not always about um, false doctrine. Sometimes it's twisted virtues, mm. right? I mean, legalism is more about behavior than a doctrine. It's kind of kind of get mixed up. Yeah. Or liberty, you know, uh, sin boldly. That's a that's a twisted virtue. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've got to have the sense and the humility and the savvy to see that. I, I wrote about, you know, I got a friend who was a, he's a security expert. He's an ex-cop. Mm -hmm. And he'd drive me nuts because he just cared about security at church. I grew up in a little town. I didn't know we had a house key. We didn't lock our, we left our keys in the car. Oh, wow. You know, we had this kind of Barney Fife kind of sheriff. That was it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we, it, it, we just didn't have, we just didn't have any danger like that. Mm. So I'm cavalier about danger. I don't care about security guards. I think it's dumb to change the locks. And here's my friend who's a security guy. You go, you got it. That's not right. Yeah. You know, these are, we don't live there. 
And pastors can be like that spiritually. Mm. Everything's fine. It'll be fine. These people all love each other. And Paul says, there's going to be wolves, savage wolves from among you. And he wasn't pointing to the whole church, I don't think. I think he's saying about those leaders. False teach wolves arise from pastors, elders, staff, people who are already in some position and have some handling of the word. They're, they're Bible teachers somehow. Mm-hmm. They're the ones, they, you know, they get up there in front and they go, you may not have heard this before, but this is what this passage is teaching. And you go, really? Wow, I thought Jesus was fully God and fully man. Mm-hmm. Well, he's, he's divine, but he's not. Really? You know? It's similar to what um, Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians when he's talking about um, the, the, like the differences with Apollos and Cephas and their teaching. And, how- right. and those guys were all teaching well. Mm-hmm. But then you had these, uh, the, the Judaizers who would come. Those were Christians. Mm-hmm. They weren't just Jews. They were believers in Jesus Christ who uh, um, kind of Velcroed to the gospel that you've got to be Jewish too. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they weren't outsiders. They were insiders. Mm-hmm. And John and Paul also talk about the Gnostics who had this love of secret knowledge. You know, we know some stuff. We've got some mysteries in our pocket. And if you come over with us, you let me teach you, I'm going to teach you some stuff you're not going to hear in Sunday school. Mm -hmm. Well, that's dangerous. It is dangerous. You know, Paul says, I'll tell you the mystery. I'll tell you the mystery straight up. There's no secret about it anymore. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the mystery. Mm-hmm. It's out. <laughs> That's out the bag. <laughs> it's out of the bag. <laughs> That's right. That's right. This anyway, is, this is I, I just, I think that uh, the young folks who feel called to the ministry and who God has confirmed that to them, then it's incumbent on, on us to become vulnerable, humble people. Mm-hmm and able and growing students of scripture. Mm. Uh, I think it's harder if you have a ministerial role where you're not preaching or teaching regularly because you're not forced to study hard. Right. Right. I mean, I worried about that in retirement. Would I study? And I, no, I haven't. I haven't had to do it like I used to. It's, you know, it's, and I, I, I didn't mean to cut you off because I, it was a pastor, um, a couple of, um, actually, at the beginning of the year, he took a sabbatical as he was actually, um, he was, he was, he felt disconnected from God because of the fact that he was doing a lot of studying for pastoral work, but not studying for personal gain. It's on heart, right? Right. And I think that, you know, that is interesting because for me, of course, you know, I study the most when I'm about to deliver a sermon. But, you know, it really challenged me to like, hey, what am I studying outside of um, my duties for, you know, creating a sermon? Like, am I really spending that time with God to really know, learn more about him, to love him more, uh, spending that time in prayer? Or do I really just devote myself entirely when I'm when it's time for me to preach or when it's time for me to 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 do something that, you know, to present the gospel in a way. And it's interesting you said that because I think that um, a lot of preachers um, tend to tend to go that route. You know, we're only going to study the most when we're about to preach because that's me. <laughs> oh, sure. Oh, yeah. And, you know, yeah. I'm not going to. I mean, I got the word. I'm good. But I think that there has to be a level of. Um, a balance to where you have to study the word for, you know, for your pastoral care or for your pastoral responsibilities or uh, ministerial duties, but you also have to study it for yourself and to, um, to develop your, or better um, to, to stronger or strongly develop your walk with Christ. Because right. I think that, as you said, there are a lot of false teachers. There are a lot of false um, preachers. There are a lot of people that are out here who are Bible thumpers. Um, I would love to call them Pharisees because, <laughs> because they're, right. they're so uh, Pharisaic in what they're do and what they're doing. But you know, we have to learn how to navigate 
you know, navigate those type of individuals, navigate those different spirits and, um, and learn how to know the word for ourselves, of course, but have a, a relationship with Christ to where he can always, you know, constantly talk to us. You know, we can have that savvy that you're ta- that you talked about. Like, right. You know, I loved, you know, when I was preaching every week, I did love the interplay between working on the sermon for the, you know, for the people mm-hmm. and the in, internalizing mm. of that same thing. Because, you know, if I would pray about a passage and I'd go, oh, man, I don't really get this part. Mm-hmm. Or why is this so hard for me? Mm-hmm. If I could internalize it, mm-hmm. one, I'm changed by the word then, and I'm being forced by that next passage up. You know, I'd preach through a book or a section of book, so I wasn't looking for stuff that I needed, so to speak. You know, right. I was just the next thing up. Well, I need everything. All scripture is profitable. Right. And so a new thing would come, and I'd have to internalize that. Sometimes it didn't speak immediately to me about something. It was just it was growing, right? It was just adding to my knowledge of Christ and the word. And, but if I could internalize, if I take the time to pray that into my own heart, I'd see where it bumped up against stuff. Mm. Uh, uh, ignorance, I didn't, I didn't get it, or resistance, or, or uh, sometimes it wasn't disobedience. It was the inability to grasp the grace in something. You know, it wasn't always that I was bad, but sometimes I just didn't understand, you know, and to, to process till it became clear and bigger than it looked when I started, Mm -hmm. then that found its way into language for the people. Mm -hmm. And I'm not telling them, I'm telling them stuff that it's not just stuff I didn't know. It's stuff that I hadn't ever had to process before. Right. Um, and that brought a kind of vividness and uh, authenticity. Mm-hmm. And so these, the work of sermon, you know, the text that I had really was feeding me. Mm-hmm. It wasn't just what I did for them. And then I had my own, quiet times or I do think it was you I wish I had been just I'm I'm not a very disciplined person yeah and I wish I had been better at just reading the Bible mm. that was never easy for me uh and I I I have friends lots of friends you know who've read through the Bible in a year they do that as a habit that never worked for me because I I can't absorb that much that fast yeah. you know it just wasn't that didn't work yeah. but I do wish I would have just read more when I retired then COVID, I mean, there was nowhere to go, nothing to do. And man, I read Bible, well, you know, at least for me. <laughs> My mother reads, you know, twice as much and she's 90, but at least I was reading a lot. And it was, it was a good thing. You know, it was just, it, it reading much does different things in your heart than reading a little. Right. You know, you know they're just two different things. I don't know that God is more pleased with one or the other. Well, they just have their different yeah. histories. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, this has been a great conversation. I This is I, fun. Yeah, it is. I personally I'm loving just sitting at your feet and just learning. <laughs> just well, like, you don't want to sit at my feet, man. But <laughs> I'm glad we got to talk. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, I'm I'm honored to have this conversation with you. Um I honestly I'm looking forward to the next conversation because I feel like we have um, connected, and I feel that we have a lot more to talk about. Sure. <laughs> There's, a lot I more, it. <laughs> There's a lot more to come. So I, I appreciate this, Tom. Um, just one last question. Um, where can people find you to connect with you and your ministry? And yeah. Again? And I would, I'd welcome that. I have a website that has, uh, it's sort of tar- aimed at pastors, but other people can look at it. Uh, and it's just my name. I have a I have the only, I'm the only guy in the world with my name. <laughs> so it's kind of easy. Uh, 
My name is Lee, L-E-E, -E. last name is Eklov, E-C-L-O-V. So it's three E's, L-E-E-E-C-L-O-V.com. And uh, there's stuff I've written. There's some articles and stuff. And uh, I do some pastor's gatherings that tells how to make those, you know, how to do. And there's a place to write to me. And so far, if somebody writes to me, I always write back. Mm -hmm. And I typically say, tell me about yourself or your ministry or I'm open to phone calls if I can. I, I don't know if I can always do that or not, you know, but uh, I, my ministry now, TJ, is I'm called to work with pastors primarily. And, and younger pastors have a special place in my heart. Uh, you know, I'm not the great visionary. I wasn't, I always said, I'm not a Moses. I'm an Aaron. <laughs> I, I just so. felt that was a better way. You know, I'm, I'm the guy that can speak to something, mm -hmm. but I'm not, the, I don't have those great leadership gifts, but I can bring wisdom and grace to pastors and especially the young pastors. So if I can do that for somebody, I, I'm happy to do it. I would love it if people read stuff I've written. I've written two books from Moody Publishers. One is called uh, Pastoral Graces, Reflections on the Care of Souls, which kind of goes to the nature of ordinary pastoring and shepherding. It's not about how to get your church bigger or how to win the lost or strategies for anything. It's just about being shepherds. Hmm. And the second book is called Feels Like Home, How Rediscovering the Church as Family Changes Everything. Hmm. And uh, those are both mentioned on my website and some other stuff. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Write me or, you know, that's fun. I'm retired. Goodness sakes. I got time. <laughs> <laughs> Right, and I'm pretty sure a lot of us have time too now that we're at the house. And yeah. And TJ, let's just do this again when you uh, when you have time, and it's this is a delight. I'm listen, my friend, you and your colleagues, people who are kind of in your world, your circles of young pastors. I am so excited about our young pastors. I feel for you, you know, I understand the work in some ways that you don't yet. And uh, when young guys have the common sense to say, I got to have an old guy in my camp, <laughs> they'll be better for it. Yeah, I, you know? agree. I agree. That wisdom is, is very, it's needed. You know, we can't get anywhere without it. Um, I, I have a, um, one of my very close elders that I'm close with in the um, church. He's um, older guy and I would cut his hair well, before we moved down here I would cut his hair every um every week and we would just talk for hours about everything and I love just I love just the conversation and just yeah the knowledge that he has because he always has gems to drop <laughs> and I'm just there well do you know what I see in you TJ that I see in a lot of our younger younger men and women is teachability mm. uh Young people who aren't teachable are headed for trouble. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's good. I just met with a guy last week, a young pastor here in Rockford. He's a works with student ministries, you know, and I, I met him at a coffee shop. I says, he was studying the Bible. I go, oh, we ought to talk. You know, he go, oh, I'd love to he came over. And he was smart. He was well read. He was fascinated with the Puritans. Mm -hmm. And I'm just humbled by his knowledge. I, I haven't read this stuff. And I think I'm so privileged and the church is so fortunate by the grace of God that there are young men and women like you who are, you know, stepping into this, this extraordinary calling, this, uh, this fellowship of shepherds. You know, we, uh, I go to conferences with, for pastors. And I always look around and go, we're not a very cool group of guys and, and women sometimes. We're not very cool. <laughs> you know, I, when I was young, it was, we're kind of a bunch of frumpy old people, but <laughs> we love Jesus. Yep. And we have 
we have watched over our flocks by night and we have studied the Bible and we've sat in hotel rooms and we've figured out, I mean, hospital rooms and we've had to do hard funerals and had people pray to us about us. I mean, we've been, we, we are, we have this commonality. Mm -hmm. We have seen extraordinary things and stood in hard places. And I, I just love talking to pastors and the young ones are good for me. I'm an old guy. And so anyway, yeah, definitely. that's a good spot to stop, I guess. Oh yeah, definitely. And I appreciate your time. I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. And like I said, we will definitely get together again. You know, we've made a lasting connection, I believe. So I will definitely, good. <laughs> I will definitely, uh, you know, bring you back on for another episode. Um, when, when the Lord gives me, the vision for something. I, I have something in mind right now that I good. think very good. That, that good for you. you in, so I'm waiting for you. <laughs> Sounds All good. right, brother. All right. Have a good one. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Thank you.